What is up, guys? Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. We're going to be talking about game selection in this episode. There's a well-known adage in poker. Perhaps you're familiar with it. It goes like this. It doesn't matter if you are the 10th best poker player in the world if you're sitting at a table with the top nine. Imagine if you were the 10th best poker player in the world. Think about how much money you could make. Think about how you'd fare in the average game. You'd almost certainly be the best poker player at every table. Maybe once in a while you'd run into one of the top nine, but you'd have the ability to beat any game that you sit in for the most part. But make a game selection error, sit with too many of the top nine, and suddenly that positive win rate disappears. Now this might sound far-fetched, but we actually see this in practice. I see this in practice as a poker coach. I see this happen a lot. And that is very good players breaking even, perhaps struggling to make money at the 500 L Zoom games on PokerStars, for example. But at the same time, I get amateur players come to me for coaching with perhaps fairly little experience. But my initial reaction is, how is this person making so much money? They'll perhaps have a win rate of 10 BB per 100 hands or more, yet they seem to lack the basic fundamentals. How is it that an inexperienced player over a fairly large sample can consistently generate a high win rate? Whereas on the flip side of the coin, very skilled players are maybe struggling to make money in some of the toughest games online. And it really all loops back to this poker adage. If you game select well, that's going to be one of the biggest improvements you can make to your win rate overnight. It's one of the most important things. If you play in a profitable game, you'll make money. If you play in a non-profitable game because your opponents are too skilled, then you won't make money. Even though it sounds so simple, so straightforward, many players don't understand the relevance of this important concept. And that's why we have very skilled players breaking even, but amateur players making thousands every week or every month. Now this is true online, but I would say it's especially true in live games. And that's partly because the stakes go a lot higher and live games can be a lot softer. So occasionally I will get an amateur online player come to me and I'm surprised at how well they're doing at the 200 Nell, 500 Nell online games. But every so often I also get amateur live players come to me and I'm surprised at how well they're doing in games with a buy-in anywhere between about 10K and 100K. And the reason why they're doing so well is because they're playing in soft games. They may not be publicly available games, they may be private games, but the point is live buy-ins go a lot higher and the games can potentially be very soft. Now, sometimes players have a negative reaction to the idea of seeking out weak games. They may use terms such as bum hunting, although to be fair, that is usually used in a heads up context. But the idea here is that deliberately seeking out weak opposition is painted in a light where it's something not very noble and a little bit sleazy. Essentially, we need to make a decision between the following. We can either make lots of money by deliberately choosing soft games, or the alternative is we deliberately challenge ourselves. We deliberately look for games where we think the average player in that game is better than us, so we can challenge ourselves. We might improve faster that way, but we won't make money, we'll lose money. Now it's down to you to decide what your objectives are, whether it's to make a lot of money or simply compete against the best players. And the answer won't necessarily be the same for everyone, but I'm probably right in saying that the majority of us are in this game to make money. Yes, we play the game because we love the game, but the overall objective is to make money. And in some cases, for some of us, if we don't make money playing the game, we can't continue to play. If we spent all of our time deliberately trying to play players that are better than us, we'd eventually end up with no bankroll and we wouldn't really be able to justify the time spent at the tables. 
So making money is really a prerequisite for continued play. If we don't make money, we can't play. So our objective is not to be noble, but really just to think about what constitutes smart business. And game selection is smart business. If we think about poker as a business, we obviously want to invest our capital in a situation which is going to generate the most returns. If we are deliberately investing our capital in a situation that's unlikely to generate returns, that's not good business. And that's what poker is for the majority of us. It's a business, it's a means of making money. If you don't care about that and you have an unlimited bankroll and you just want to play for the fun of playing, don't worry about game selection. You are very likely going to have fun regardless of the environment. In fact, you may get a thrill out of trying to take down the stronger players. Your objective is not to make money anyway. And the whole point of game selection is to help us meet the objective of making more money. So if that's not your objective, then game selection is not really for you. For the rest of us, it's just smart business to invest our capital in a situation which is going to generate the most returns. And just to return to this idea of bum hunting, poker rooms also use terms such as predatory. Why have poker rooms invented terms such as predatory when describing seeking out weak players? If we think about that word predatory, it's often reserved for some of the darkest criminal activities that take place. And here, poker rooms are deliberately using that term to describe table selection. Is it because they care about creating a fair environment for everyone? and they care about nobility and sportsmanship? No, that's not the reason. The reason is actually related to the poker ecology. It's bad for the poker room if the recreational players lose their bankroll too quickly. That's not really our problem. We're poker players, we're not running a casino. We can let the poker room worry about the poker ecology. Our job as poker players is simply to funnel as many chips from the network as we can through skilled play. Hopefully we now appreciate the importance of table selection. Let's talk about some of the metrics we can use to ascertain whether a certain game is a good place to be playing. I'd like to take you back to the earlier days of online poker and the most common method of game selection was looking at a couple of statistics which were available in the poker lobby. Uh, these stats were players per flop and average pot size. And it makes sense that players would use these as metrics for gauging the quality of a game because really they were the only statistics available in the online lobby. There wasn't really much else you could use. For whatever reason, poker rooms decided to list players per flop and the average pot size for every game running. So old school poker players would use these to try and decide whether a game was worth playing. The basic idea here is that the larger the numbers, the softer the games. So if the average pot size is larger, that must mean players are splashing chips around. There's more money to win. If the average players per flop was higher, Again, it would increase the likelihood that there were many recreational players because if you look at the differences between a game full of regs and a game full of fish, there are more heads up pots in the game full of regs, whereas there are more family pots in soft games. Live players can attest to this. We'll often see three-way, four-way or five-way pots in a live environment. That's because the average caliber of the players in those games is lower, depending on the game, of course. Now, the next question, is this still a good way of table selecting? And in reality, the answer is no. This was never a very good way of table selecting, even to begin with. There's a couple of issues with using these stats that many players are not aware of. For example, did you know that many poker rooms only use the last 50 hands in order to calculate these statistics. 
that's an extremely small sample size. In the period of 50 hands, we will not get a representative value for these stats. Those statistics will be more representative of short-term variance. In other words, if everyone is being dealt big hands over the 50 hand sample, the average pot size is going to go up, the players per flop is going to go up. If everyone is card dead, then the average pot size is going to go down. So those values really just show how the table is running. Now there could always be exceptions. Perhaps you play at a poker room and you know for a fact that that poker room actually uses the last 500 or last 1000 hands for calculating those values. Well, what percentage of players do you think actually stay at a regular table for a thousand hands? There's a very high likelihood that the players who are present at that table at the beginning of that sample are not the same players who are there at the end of that sample. So regardless of the sample size on these stats, those values are mostly noise. They don't represent reliable data points, which we can base our table selection strategy off of. So the next logical question, if it's not recommended to use players per flop and average pot size, what should we use as metrics for good table selection? The most important aspect of good table selection is the presence of individual weak players at the table. If you are hoping for some groundbreaking revelation on how average stats indicate premium tables, well, it's not really about average stats. It's about individual weak opponents that we can target. The very behavior that a poker room might describe as predatory. On the flip side, we don't like there to be too many strong regs at our table, because if there are strong regs, they're going to make it harder for us to isolate ourselves heads up against the weaker players because they are trying to do the same as us. In other words, we're going to have to share the recreational players between us. So the ideal scenario is a table that's completely full of weak players. It's good to keep in mind that there are different types of weak players. For example, we have very loose and volatile weak players, but we also have weak tight players. For example, nits. Nits are a type of weak player. We don't mind having nits at our table. It's just that the way we exploit a nit is very different from the way that we would exploit a loose, volatile recreational player. And if you've ever been at a table that's full of loose, volatile, recreational players, you'll probably be aware that things can get kind of crazy. We end up playing lots of multi-way pots. Even when we get dealt aces pre-flop and try and get the chips all in, we often find that we are dealing with a three-way all in or a four-way all in. So although it's still very profitable to have a table full of volatile fish, we often find that it does up our variance simply because we are playing so many more multi-way pots. I sometimes imagine that the ideal table is one that has one or two volatile fish and then the rest of the players knits. That's a much lower variance scenario for us because we can generally just exploit the knits by stealing their blinds. They stay out of the way unless they have something strong and allow us heads up action versus the volatile fish. But really, these are just theories. The most important thing is the number of recreational or weak players that we have on our table. The more, the better. And on the flip side, the fewer the skilled regs at our table, the better it's going to be for table selection. Now we sometimes run into slightly more advanced theories. For example, one of the very common theories that you'll hear is we want to be on the left of the fish. So for example, when the fish is in the small blind, we're in the big blind and we have position on the fish. And an extended part of this theory is that money flows around the table in a clockwise direction. So it flows towards the player that has position. Now it sounds intelligent, it might be true, it might be logical. Honestly, I don't really care that much. 
whether this is true or not doesn't really make a big difference to me. I'm not so much interested in my position against the recreational players, purely that they're present at the table. Because having a recreational player to my left is also very good. Every time I'm on the button, that recreational player is going to be in the small blind. We'll be able to play heads up pots in position. Having a recreational player two to my left is also very good because every time I'm on the button, that player is now in the big blind. Now, it does seem logical to me that the closer we are in position to the recreational player, the easier it will be to get involved in heads up pots against them. So the opposite scenario is that the recreational player is the exact opposite end of the table from us. But I wouldn't generally pass up on a table just because I don't like the distribution of the fish at the table. The most important thing is that those fish are present, not their precise locations at the table. And that's because isolating ourselves heads up against weaker players is not some passive side effect of our precise position at the table. It's something that we deliberately engineer. We're deliberately targeting the weaker players. We're deliberately trying to maneuver the situation so that we play as many post-flop spots heads up against weaker players as possible. So whatever the position of the weak player at the table, if we're playing well, we'll find ways to isolate ourselves against that weaker player. So now that our objective is clear, let's think about how we can recognize weaker players. The most obvious example is a known opponent whom we have history against. So in an online context, this may be a player that we've left a colored tag on to indicate that he's a recreational player. In a live context, it's simply recognizing a player at the table whom we've played against before and we know is a weaker player. This is the most obvious way of identifying weak opposition is a known opponent at the table who will donate funds to us. Having said that, Sometimes we're stepping into a new environment. It's a table who we don't know any of the players at. So is there a way that we can infer the presence of weaker players at the table without explicitly knowing or having history with any of those players? One thing we look for is players who have less than a full stack but are not rebuying. So in an online context, this is usually a stack between about 40 big blinds and 99 big blinds. Either way, it's clear that this player doesn't have auto rebuy enabled. And one thing that pretty much all decent regs do is have auto rebuy enabled in an online game. So if they don't have that option turned on, it drastically increases the chances that this is a recreational player. Now, why do we say between 40 and 99? If a player has 23 big blinds, aren't they also a recreational player? Yes, they are a recreational player, but we just don't care that much about 23 big blinds. We like a decent chunk of chips to win. So even the worst recreational player is not going to be that profitable if they only have five big blinds on the table, for example. So we do want a decent chunk of chips that we can potentially win. Things are a little bit different in a live environment. It would presumably be bad etiquette to auto rebuy every time we fold our big blind back up to 200 big blinds, for example. But good live players will typically still rebuy when their stack depth drops significantly below their initial buy-in amount. If they are buying in for 200 big blinds, it's usually because they have a strategy that's specific to playing 200 big blind effective. So if they drop down to 100 big blinds, well, that technically changes their strategy. So what they'll likely do is rebuy back to 200 big blinds. So if a typical buy-in for your live game is 200 big blinds, we can probably tell at a glance how many players are not really hovering around or above that standard buy-in amount. If someone has clearly dropped a bunch of chips but is not rebuying, that's going to be more of an indication that we're dealing with a recreational player.
Part of this process is also thinking about room selection. So a slightly broader perspective, obviously a room contains games. Within that room, we want to think about the best games to play, but the room we choose initially will have a big impact on the average quality of the games within that room. In other words, some rooms are softer than others. Some casinos are softer than others. So if we have a good room selection or good casino selection initially, it's going to increase the likelihood that any given game within that room is going to be a game that we'd like to play and is going to be profitable for us. Room selection is a whole other topic, however, we'll very likely talk about room selection in a separate Red Chip Poker podcast episode. Finally, we can look at the appearance of our opponents. Now, this is a little bit of a looser science. I don't doubt that some players are more skilled than others in this area. That's to have a look at our opponent's avatar and screen name in an online context, and to have a look at our opponent's physical appearance in a live context. In terms of live play, maybe you have some ability to look at your opponent, how they're dressed, how they're holding themselves at the table, how they move their chips around. You may have a good handle on whether that's likely to be a professional or a recreational player. And you may be able to pick that up just in a couple of minutes of observing the table, especially if you have a lot of experience as a live player, you know how players typically handle their chips, how they make bets, how they handle their whole cards. Of course, we won't always be right with this assumption. For example, a strong online player could delve into live play and he might be a very tough player, but doesn't really know how to handle his chips. Can't really do any chip tricks. We might assume that's a recreational player, but then we find out that they're not, for example. So this is not 100% accurate, but based on your previous observations as a live player, you may be able to pinpoint certain opponents at a table in a short space of time who are an above average likelihood of being a recreational player. In terms of online games, a simple example could be a screen name that has a specific theoretical poker concept. We know that that's probably less likely to be a recreational player. If someone's talking about triple range merges or GTO or C betting in their screen name, it decreases the likelihood that this is a genuine recreational player. If we were to run analysis on avatars, we would probably find that there is a link one of the common jokes is that recreational players usually have pictures of babies as their avatar. Who knows if that's really true? I don't really care too much because I usually use other metrics for table selecting. I'd rather get on a table, find out how everyone's playing, leave a colored tag and use that for my table selection next time. But just so you know, there could be something in avatar, screen name, or our opponent's appearance in a live context that helps us pinpoint them as a recreational player. Finally, let's talk about evaluation. Uh, this is the idea that we won't always know whether a certain table is a good table. We might suspect it's a decent place to play, or it could just be that we really have no idea whether it's a good table. But after we sit down and play a few hands, we will eventually know whether it's a good table. The other thing that might happen is that it is a good table, but it changes while we're there. Some of the weaker players leave, they're replaced by stronger players, and it turns out that it's really not a very good table anymore. The key concept here is that in terms of table selection, leaving a bad table is just as important as finding a good one. So at the beginning of our session, we get on a good table, or if we're an online player, we'll get on a range of good tables. But over the course of the session, some of those tables will deteriorate. And many players might just continue to play. They've done their table selection, right? They did it at the beginning of the session. They don't need to worry about that anymore. But the problem is over the course of the session, perhaps 50% or more of those tables are no longer good tables but the player continues to play. 
So it's important to continually reevaluate our table as we play. This is true whether you are a live or online player. A table that might start out as a good table choice ends up being a bad table choice. So continuing to reevaluate will make the difference between continuing to play on that bad table or realizing that this table's not really so good anymore. Let's leave this table. Let's find a more profitable table based on our game selection criteria. Well, thanks very much for listening. Hopefully you've got something to think about now in terms of game selection. This was Coach Weasel, and this was the Red Chip Poker Podcast.